Hello, Autumn.
Can you hear me, ma'am? Do you know where your mute button is at? Yes. Okay, perfect, good. You have any questions before we start? <laughs> I'm nervous. I know. Don't worry, um, they're not posting the recordings until 23 December, so you have a couple weeks after we do this. <laughs> okay. No, I have, um, I, have go my, ahead. I have my talking points, but I'm afraid that my eyes will wander. Oh, I know, I know. So I will, um, I will uh, primarily, I'm interested in, you, you can talk about your platform. Um, if you feel that you want to elaborate or include something, please do so. Um, yours is most interesting because it's coming through Spark. So I'm going to focus on that. And if you have anything you'd like to add, go ahead, okay? Okay. <laughs> but you're going to stick to the three questions, right? <laughs> So I'm going to ask, um, can you explain how Care Starter was introduced to these channels? So I'll give you a brief introduction, right? So I flipped it a little bit, but I just kind of, I, for each of the panelists, I address them and then I give a quick intro and then I'll ask the questions. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, and then also, if you'd like to include uh, some of your responsibilities, I'll ask that as well, right? As, as the POC. So you're good, ma'am. You're good. Your word. Hello, Major Black. See you fine. Welcome. I'm excited to see you. So, would you like to make? Would you like, since you're in civilian clothes, would you like me to address you as Mr. Black, Major Black? Either's fine. Okay, good. You have any? <laughs> um, do you have any questions about what I outlined for your project? Oh. Okay, good. Well, I I didn't know. I don't know much about aircraft. So if you want to go into more detail, please do so. Um, you know, driving that warfighter, it's, it's what we will all want to see. But um, yeah, I didn't, you'll have to explain that. All yeah, right. no, no worries. I, I think I, uh, I know what you were, you were trying to get at. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at uh, doing that translation. Okay, great. Um, we'll see. I don't know if Autumn's on. She might just have it. So my lead, um, Greg, he was on. I'm not sure why he jumped off. <clears throat> so this is my first one too, Major, if that makes you feel any better. I tend to talk with my hands too. Go ahead. So I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, so. Whew. Right, so I don't think they want to see us be robots. I think that, you yeah. know, we're, we're human and if you're sharing your experiences, so please yeah. just be comfortable. Yeah, just want to say hi and, and welcome. I'm, I'm actually on an, on another Zoom, so that's why I've been silent this whole time. But thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, we'll get started in probably less than five minutes. I'm waiting for Joey uh, to join us. Uh, and I know he's online, so right. he's, okay. and uh, we lost Greg. Where did he go? I'm not sure. I, I heard that he may not be able to make it. So I'm, I, I don't know, um, but um, I will let, uh, I will promote everyone to panelists. Um, and Vanessa, I believe you're going to be the moderator, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to hand off. Uh, are, are you pretty familiar with Zoom? Do you? Uh, um, I've used it a couple times, but not okay. primarily. No worries. Zoom. I'll stay on until everyone's on, and then I'll I'll need to jump off. But I'll I'll get you all situated. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And just by the way, just so you know, I, yeah, you are live, so um, everyone can can see and hear hear us right now. Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. Just just want to let you, let you know. All right. I'm gonna sign. Um, I'm not gonna sign off. I'm just gonna mute and turn my video off.
Okay, I think we're all here. Uh, hi, Joey. How are you? Great, man. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to make you host if you don't mind, Joey. Is that all right? Boom. Ready to rock. Okay, cool. Um, but I believe all of the panelists are here, so you're all set to go. Um, let me let me promote you to make host. All right, you're in control, Joey. And John, are is uh, do we just start at the <laughs> what? Yeah, I think we're good to start at the half an hour. Okay. I think we'll see the numbers jump a fair amount. So. Yeah, I agree. I was gonna. My plan was to wait minutes, minute or so past the the time, and then we'll just jump into it and get it rolling. Cool. We have about seven attendees right now, so I'm going to say I'm mute and go. Everyone, we're going to jump in and start here in just a moment. Uh, we are waiting for a few more folks to jump in and join us on the attendee side. And so we're just gonna hang out for a couple moments. And in the meantime, we have cool backgrounds and I'm sure we'll just be smiling, hanging along.
All right, everyone, uh, we're, we're going to get this going. So uh, first, I wanted to welcome everyone to the, the TPOC uh, working panel and uh, wanted to also let you know that at any point, you should be thinking about uh, any kind of questions that you want to talk about with our panelists. But to start us off, I want to give everybody on the on the line here kind of a broad overview of what a TPOC, a technical POC is, and how it fits into the construct that AF Ventures has put together. So the technical POC is anybody in the Air Force that has a problem and is willing to help a company solve their problem. And the way that AF Ventures looks at this is there are multiple places where a technical POC can fit into the process. From the very beginning, we ask them to fill out what we call a focus area. And it's basically just a problem statement that everybody can see and clearly understand what they are trying to solve. And we go through some curation processes on that to make sure that when it actually goes out onto the website, then everybody is able to understand that, particularly from a company perspective. So in, in that very beginning stages, those early stages, we're trying to get raw and un, uh, unfiltered problems from the entire force. And so when we look at those, we, we want to make sure that it is able to come from the lowest levels all the way to the highest level so that everybody can take advantage of the process. The, the next piece that uh, we want to hit upon is what, what it means to be a TPOC when it comes to doing the actual work of working with SIBR companies and SITR companies. So the SIBR companies, uh, predominantly the TPOC comes into play into phase two. So you're looking at those larger dollar values and those longer award times, but you are going to be responsible for making sure that the work that is going to be put onto contract is the work that you need to be done. And it all starts with the MOU. So the MOU is the memorandum of understanding that you work with the company on to make sure that all of the details are correct. Your problem is clearly outlined in the statement of work and you have all the players associated with that in line and in contact so that when it comes to executing the contract, if they get an award, you're able to understand and, and they are able to understand what it takes in order to be successful. So that's just a very, very, very brief overview of the TPOCs and how they work together and, and the inject places for, uh, for the different areas of app ventures. So when we, when we do all these other things, there are multiple ways that we communicate uh, across the board. So there are teams up on MS Teams. There's a place on Union to be able to go and talk to the companies and to yourselves. And we can we can go into all those details at, at a future junction. But for this particular event, I, we just wanted to hit what those high levels look like. And for those of you that are government, uh, how you can get into the system. So afworks.af.mil is a great place to start. And you can get to idea scale, which is where we collect those focus areas. And you can also look at what else is going on in the Air Force and in the app ventures world. So with all that being said, uh, we wanted to be able to bring a panel of people together that have actually gone through the process and can impart different lessons that they've learned along the way as they've interacted with companies, as they've gone through and tried to move these uh, move the solutions that companies present into solving their problems. And so the, the list of people that we have today, starting, starting at the, my top, is Miss Autumn Krill, who is with the Headquarters Space Command and, as an Acquisition Program Manager. We also have Captain Joey Aurora, who is one of the visionaries and founding members of AFWorks and AF Ventures, and has, has played a large role in shaping how all of this has come together. We have Major Tanya Destinhill with the 60th Medical Group and Major Michael Black with Air Force Global Strike Command. And finally, we have Miss Vanessa Perner, who is part of the, our AF Ventures team and is one of the key leaders in the, TPOC, in the TPOC engagement world. So before we turn everything over to Vanessa to do the Q&A session, I also wanted to reiterate that we uh, have this chat function available. 
So as we're moving through this Q&A session, please feel free to put any questions that you may have into the chat panel. And at the end, we're gonna try and pull a couple of them to make sure that we can get those to the panel and get their thoughts and feedback on them. So Vanessa, over to you. Hi, thanks, Greg. Thanks for the quick intro. Um, to all the panelists, thank you for joining us and your busy schedule, we appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna start with Autumn. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Um, you led the Space and Missile Center Directorate of Special Programs through a successful phase three SBIR. The United Data Library platform has been created and implemented. Can you tell us a little bit about this platform and who it serves? I can't hear you, Autumn. Even with us mic testing and doing stuff beforehand, not everything works perfectly when we when we go live. So thank you guys for bearing with us. I can come back to Autumn because I believe your uh, project and experience uh, will offer a lot of information. All right, I will start with uh, Major Dustin Hill. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. All right, so Spark is a base level approach to AFWorks. This approach seeks entrepreneurs within the forces at base level and encourages innovative applications. Your initiative is a prime example of airmen taking advantage of in, um, innovative opportunities rather than doing nothing about a known problem. Um, you're a leading care starter at care mapping uh, for EFMP or Exceptional Family Member Program. This is a 20.R project that has not transitioned to phase three, but it has proven 2,400% increase um, in patient care by milestone four. Congratulations. Um, can you tell us a little bit of how Care Starter was introduced through these channels? Well, first I would like to say it's been a pleasure and honor to work with or partner with Care Starter. It's a con Congress approved uh, initiative. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, well, one of our local Phoenix Spark Cell members, Brian Herms, he went to an AFWorks event in Austin, Texas, and he was able to hear the founder of CareStarter present, um, and he knew immediately that this is something that he, he should bring back to the med group. He hadn't seen anything like this. So he reached out to my team and asked if CareStarter could demo um, their presentation to us. And as soon as I heard the presentation, I just knew that this would definitely benefit not only Travis, but I saw something bigger for this, the entire med group uh, going Air Force wide. So it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to pilot this program and hopefully impact the future of our, our family members and our family members who are of active duty members who are enrolled in EFMP. Absolutely. Um, so your responsibilities as a technical point of contact through, uh, through the SPARK program, can you give us a little bit of um, details about what you do, what you've had to do through this process? Well, at every stage, they have what's called milestones. Um, Care Starter has 10 milestones. We're on milestone four right now, or we just completed it. So at each phase, they, they present um, the steps that are required to um, to roll out this pilot um, from vetting the, the providers in our local area in a 50 mile region, determining what needs our families actually have, um, what gaps there are, contacting them to make sure that their TRICARE, they accept TRICARE, um, and then just really dive in deep to see what are the concerns that the family members have. We tend to always focus on the active duty and getting them to their next assignment, but sometimes we often forget about the family, not just the person enrolled in EFMP, but the but the siblings or the spouse, the people who are taking care of the EFMP family member. Um, so they really did a research to to identify all those gaps and, and connect us to resources that unknown resources in our in our community. That's amazing. Thank you. You actually highlighted my next point, which is um, measurements and milestones. So Joey, as a leading member of the AF Ventures team, you have dedicated time and effort to uh, two SBIR phase two projects. Um, at this point in phase two, what can you tell 
other TPOCs to expect as they measure their milestones? Yeah, thanks for the question, Vanessa and team. And the, the biggest question that we wanna figure out as we're measuring milestones is, are they meeting the goals that you had set forward? Right, projects are going to change and iterate as you're going through them. So you need to have clear, consistent communication with the company as you're trying to figure out how are they doing? Is it meeting the objectives? And this is not about changing the guidepost as you're going through it. You have specific things that you're looking to measure that you're looking to accomplish with this R&D project. So have an honest discussion about where we're at. You wrote down the milestones in conjunction with the company, ideally, mm -hmm. and created those. So that's what you should be validating against. In addition, right now, the AFWorks team, is, the Ventures team, is we're using email to go back and forth on these deliverables. Uh, we're currently alpha testing a system that we use software. We've built a, a back end to work with companies, work with the TPOCs to take in those deliverables and make that whole process a lot smoother from initial submission to tracking and providing a dashboard to do that process. So we're, we're testing some stuff here in the back end that'll hopefully make this process easier and more visible to everyone. I'm like, hey, here are the 10 milestones that the company has. And it's all visible in one place and it's not just stuck inside of the contract. That's wonderful. I'm looking forward to uh, working on that platform. As far as um, navigating products or their project under construction, what strong advice could you give TPOCs at all levels to make sure um, that they are working with companies to achieve, achieve that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would highly recommend like at least meeting with your company once a week. Um, you know, ideally you should be working with that the company and it shouldn't just be a fire and forget kind of project. Mm -hmm. You should be heavily focused on how can you engage with them and check in on where it's at. How are, how's the execution going? Be a part of the meetings that they're having with stakeholders to learn where that project is headed. You know, we want to be active partners with these companies to make sure that it's both successful on the company side, but also on the government side. We want these people to have the right stakeholders involved, the right people engaged, and it's up to us on the military side to help drive that change. Thank you, Joey. Major Black, hello. So you're gonna to have to give us a few more details on your project. Um, Air wing operations were enhanced with the implementation of innovative TriSphere robots. How did Air Force SBIR drive an aggressive timeline for the development effort of the munitions lift equipment? Yep, so I, I can give you a uh, hopefully not too belabored of, of background on that. So the, the, the uh, bottom line on this one is that this equipment is what's used to uh, put weapons on aircraft, which sounds really simple, but it's actually a, a rather complex process. And there's a lot mm -hmm. that goes into it, a lot of training. Um, th the backstory on this is current equipment that we use um, was designed in the 50s and 60s, if you can believe that. Um, the, the most modern was designed in the 70s and into the 80s. So you can literally see pictures of a piece of equipment loading a bomb on a plane in Vietnam in like 1965. And that same piece of equipment is what we use to load weapons on the F-35 today. So as you might imagine, there's probably been, you know, a little bit of technology advancement between 1965 and 2020. Um, and, and for various reasons, the Air Force just hasn't really gotten on board with that as far as integrating it into weapons loading. So what the, the company, uh, the, the, their initial proposal, it was very fighter focused. So it was kind of geared towards the F-35. Um, within Global Strike, we had kind of an urgent need that cropped up rather suddenly over the last couple of years related to hypersonic weapons. So as I'm sure you've seen in the news, uh, we're trying to acquire those very rapidly. Um, as you hopefully have all seen in the news, they're somewhat larger than some of our, our uh, traditional legacy weapons. So that's introduced some additional complications specific to bombers. So I say all that, um, we, we basically got the kind of phase one proposal from the company. They were doing the normal, hey, let's, let's try and find a, an Air Force stakeholder um, thing. And then, like I said, their proposal was fighter focused. We kind of redirected them and said, hey, well, we're interested in that. Um, but we also have this much more urgent need, at least uh, from our perspective within Global Strike, uh, to go after this, the, the hypersonic weapon issue. So they, they were able to, you know, in the space of about less than a week, pivot the initial phase one. Yep, cool. You know, this trisphere technology is great. We could use it for fighters, but we're also 100% confident we can use it for, for bombers in this heavier lift capacity. So, and like I said, in, in under a week, they had basically completely revamped what, what their initial uh, proposal was 
to kind of what we needed them to go after for the phase two. That, that's amazing. Thank you for um, highlighting the fact that you're able to redirect the focus area. That's something for others that are interested in pursuing um, pursuing a project to consider, right? So re read through those focus areas, make sure uh, you if you find something that might work, try to redirect it. Thank you. Um, so how did this process differ from the conventional uh, production of airframe parts? So I, I'm, I imagine quite a bit considering the last production was in the 70s. Yeah, just, just a bit. so so kind of the, the two main, I guess the, the, the two or a couple of the main differences would be first off, obviously, you know, the, the overall structure of Sibra versus traditional acquisition. Um, it's a lot more rapid. You, you can uh, move a lot quicker. You know, uh, we're, we're working with uh, Air Force Materiel Command and, and the, the legacy folks that would be responsible for ultimately uh, acquiring and sustaining this, you know, long term. So they're involved but uh, just from something as simple as a funding perspective. So they don't have any money to support this. We're, we're trying to work with them to, you know, close that gap over the next couple of fiscal years or two, hopefully. But mm -hmm. if, if I went to them right now today, I and mean, we actually did this because we, we had identified this hypersonic weapon gap before um, the company had approached us, you know, trying to make the phase one to phase two jump. And we got to those folks and we said, hey, you know, we have this issue. We, we need to get after this. And they said, yeah, we agree. Uh, do you have any money? We said, well, no, I, I don't have any money right now. Um, that's kind of your job. And they said, uh, we agree, but we don't have any money either. So we we're really, from the traditional acquisition perspective, we we're basically at an impasse. Um, and it just so happened fortuitously that this super company came along and we said, oh, okay, well, now that maybe provides a different avenue, opens up some additional potential sources of funding that we were able to leverage um, both matching funds as well as some some money we were able to come up with it, it opens up a lot more opportunities um, and it's it, it can be a fair bit more agile and, and really the, the what we're trying to go towards is not you know we're going to buy everything under a sibling you know, that's not what the program is for we're, we're going to prototype these one or two mm -hmm. hopefully they prove out and then that will be the point where we've already involved the material command folks, like I said, so we can transition to a more traditional acquisition program. So since you've been what we call a successful phase three, how would you encourage others to um, drive these opportunities? Um, so realistically, what was your time frame for your project? Uh, so, Plus or minus a couple months because there were some COVID impacts, um, fabrication, right. some other stuff. But uh, the, con the the initial phase one into phase two discussions happened spring of last year. Uh, the phase two contract was awarded in July, and our initial uh, initial plan was to have a prototype ready about this time, maybe a, a a few months earlier in 2020. So basically a year and change. And like I said, COVID impacted that a little bit. So now we're looking at more like. Uh, the, the prototype's ready now and probably start testing uh, January, February timeframe. So basically 12 to 18 months was kind of the, the goal of contract award to have an iron uh, physically assembled and, and start to test it out. Good. So you would encourage others to definitely take this avenue? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, if so again, there's, there's some nuances with it. And, and one of the uh, other points that I think is probably worth mentioning with, with the uh, this project specifically is a, a lot of these, you know, it's kind of a bottom up approach where somebody in the field has a good idea, then they try to, you know, figure out ways to support it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this one, I think is a little bit different because it was more of a top down in the sense that I'm at the MAGCOM and we worked right. with the folks at AFMC at the MAGCOM level. So, you know, it, it was, we already had that buy-in inherently, whereas if you're coming from the bottom up in the field, um, you may have to work to get that, which I would obviously highly encourage you to do because if your MAGCOM is not on board, then all the best idea in the world is probably not going to survive contact um, from a financial perspective if you don't have your folks at, at the MAGICOM on board. All right. Thank you, Major Black. I appreciate that. Autumn, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Welcome back. Thanks. So, Sorry about that. I... <laughs> that's okay. So as I was mentioning, um, you led the Space and Missile Center Directorate of Special Programs for a successful SBR Phase 3. Um, can you tell us about the platform and who it serves? Yeah, so it's the Unified Data Library, and it's actually um, a data platform 
that what we say, um, kind of our little tagline is freeing the data, right? So we, in many instances throughout my Air Force career and now working for Space Force, um, we do a really good job of buying mission systems that couple the data with the mission system. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't help us in the long run. That runs us into a lot of proprietary issues with actually extracting data that could be used um, in many other ways. Uh, data is one of the most valuable things that we have. Uh, I think General Raymond recently talked about it being, and, and General Goldstein talked about being currency now. And so the Unified Data Library allows folks to come uh, at an unclassified level, a secret level, and a TS level and expose their data. Um, our team allows them to provide access to that data so we are not uh, kind of in the middle of that. Um, and so we're able to what we call free the data from the mission system. So if there's another mission system, as you doesn't matter what kind of uh, job you have, you probably have two or three systems that you've used, sometimes the same data you're looking at in, in different ways. Um, and by freeing that data, we're actually allowing more folks to get at information and pair and combine information um, into other mission systems they may have not thought to use that data before. Uh, the SIPR process was uh, ex extremely easy for us, uh, much like uh, Mr. Black was talking about, we kind of had a, um, a downward approach. It came actually from General Raming wanting to expose commercial um, space, uh, commercial space data to uh, folks at the NSCC, folks at um, the CSPOC. And so not only do we support um, space customers, because that was the primary customer that we were focused on, now the Air Force has um, adopted the Unified Data Library as Data 1 through JADC2 or ABMS. Some folks on the line may be familiar with that. And so we've actually expanded, um, we're in the process of increasing the ceiling on the server from about 37 million in three years to, um, it's gonna be a five year effort now for $239 million. So integrating data across the board from, like I said, from the unclass to the TS level is really valuable. And um, we were able to use this, this, uh, this vehicle and make it easy on ourselves uh, to get a small company to come in and um, prototype and then expand that prototype across the Air Force and Space Force. So it's been extremely um, flexible. The one thing that I would highlight is, um, and, and we get a lot of questions about our data rights. So SIBRs have unique data rights and it's really important, um, obviously being a data platform that we understand the technical data rights that we have. Um, fortunately, uh, we had a pretty, good relationship with the, the, um, the small business and they provided GPR data rights after we initially uh, awarded the SIBR um, back to the government, which is, that's pretty unique, right? That doesn't happen all the time. But um, the one thing that I would caution folks um, in looking at this, this mechanism is, you know, more and more of the Air Force and Space Force are looking at um, getting away from proprietary solutions. We won't need open architecture. We need to be able to um, to own that code. And um, sometimes SIBRs can be a little bit um, unique with, with regard to data rights. So ensure that you're looking at those data rights um, as you uh, look at this vehicle possibility. Um, overall, it, it's been awesome. We were able to negotiate after awarding um, the data rights to be all GPR. So we have um, unique data rights that sometimes you wouldn't uh, find on a suburb because we did a modification after the fact. Oh, so you brought up modifications. Um, Joey, can you talk a little bit on modifications through this process? Yeah, absolutely. So mods are something that we've had to do multiple times and it's really about getting together with the government stakeholders and understanding, hey, where do things need to change? What in the environment has changed? And then working with the company to redo the milestones. And then the team has a wonderful mod request form up on Union that the contractor has to submit. It goes to the contracting officer to validate, hey, does this still fit the same criteria? Mm -hmm. And does this still fit where are we going to go uh, to execute that? And then they work with the contracting officer, put the mod in place, and execute from there. 
Wonderful, thank you. So what I'd like to um, bring, uh, speak on next is every one of these projects is different. Um, I know Autumn's required an ATO, the dreaded ATO, right? So can we talk about overcoming right, the ATO process? So traditionally this could be um, up to 18 months or more to acquire. So the authorization to operate, uh, when would you recommend, Autumn, that TPOX uh, initiate that process? Yeah, sooner is better, right? Um, it's, you know, it's daunting. The task can be overwhelming. We were really fortunate to have a lot of, um, you know, senior level engagement to help us with that. I, you know, General Kreider, General Raymond, these were all, you know, extremely important advocates and getting um, the, this platform off the ground and ensuring that it could support um, Space Force and the Air Force. And But as far as the ATO is concerned, it's never easy. We're in the cloud, and I think that made it a lot easier for us. We, we work through the M20 office out of um, the 16th Air Force, working uh, through AWS. And a lot of that uh, had really been paved for us, right? The, we're not the only... Uh, people in town trying to get an ATO. Uh, we actually have a lot of people inside of our own um, organization, inside um, SNC SPG, that were doing similar activities and getting their ATO um, through the process. And I think senior level engagement was it was critical, but most importantly, is the starting at the beginning, right? As soon as you know you have something that's going, you know, is going to need to connect um, to the rest of the community, it's really important that you start early um, and and have your ducks in a row, right? That was the biggest thing. We When we went to our GAO and we had all our paperwork laid out, um, there were some things we didn't have and we learned, um, but I really think we leveraged the M2O community um, out of the ACC um, 16th Air Force folks. They obviously do this all the time so they could help us um, better understand what we needed, um, but start early start often and, and ask the right questions, right? If you don't know something, the best thing you can do is pick up the phone and say, hey, I don't understand this. What do I need? Um, folks are willing to help a lot of times, but uh, I think we all are pretty intimidated uh, at, at times. And so we don't ask uh, often or early enough about the ATO process. Wonderful, thank you. That was gonna be my next question. What words of encouragement could you give uh, government users and companies right, uh, seeking technology that requires this um, this permission. So thank you. Um, does Nessa, anybody- if I can jump in there oh, ahead, on please. the ATO piece as well, is right, Ventures is working really closely with Platform One on mm -hmm. building a process. So right, I've left full time from the AppWorks team to go actually take a role with Platform One and help solve that problem. And we need to build a process to get the ATO through that's repeatable, scalable, and that's still been a challenge for many vendors with Platform One and the Iron Bank process. But we're, we're building a checklist, we're building an onboarding guide, we're building an easy pathway for companies to get through and get an ATO in days and weeks, not months and years. And we've mm -hmm. had companies go, you know, they do their containerization, they've had companies go through Platform One in a matter of four days to a few weeks. And that's something that we can make repeatable and scalable. And that's something that's going to be really important for the SBIR process. Oh, thanks, yeah, Joey. Yeah, actually, here. Joey, we're actually working from a um, uh, UDL perspective right now through that process. So I think there's a lot that we're learning. Um, I think it's really important to establish that process and get folks um, something, somebody to hold their hand a little bit, right? So um, that was one of the things that we found, I think, working through the MTO office now working with Platform One, the more interaction and the better um, technical exchanges that we can have through that process have really helped speed it up. And I think once we get, you know, half a dozen or more folks through that process, we're going to be able to uh, make a lot, a lot of people's lives a lot easier. So totally agree that that repeatable process is, is something we're very excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. So now we're gonna take some time and uh, review the questions that have come up in chat. Um, so for the yeah, first so what, question, sorry. So I, I can dive in, we've been going back and forth in chat there, Vanessa. So okay. uh, one of the big ones has been, hey, how do we get the MAGCOMs to get involved in the process? And how do we get them to look at out years funding? 
and where do we pull them in that process? And I know Mike has some great thoughts here as well. So please, uh, anyone here, jump in as we discuss this. Uh, AFWorks is, you know, our recommendation is engage with the stakeholders, the program offices, the MAGCOMs as early as possible. And you know, I've been a flight commander, I've been at the flight level, and right, sometimes that it feels like MAGCOM is very distant. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have to go up the chain of command to do that. Well, the, we have functional in our Air Force for a reason, right? There's supposed to be your immediate link to that MATCHCOM. In addition, there's going to be an 06 representative just for innovation ideas and connection to AppWorks at every MATCHCOM going forward. That's something the vice made a request about and pushed out to the different MATCHCOMs. So those should be the people you're reaching out to initially, whether it's your functionals, the 06 representative, to get them engaged in this process and help get get you connected to the right people at the MAGCOM level or the program office level. And so that, and to address when you want to do that, I would say do it early, like even before you know whether the project is successful or not, let them know you are doing this because the Air Force plans funding around what capabilities do we need? And if we can address, hey, what capabilities do we need? And then we know we have funding aligned to a different project, maybe we can take into account how we need to realign that funding in the future and make people aware that we might realign funding or we might address something a little differently. And so that's what I would recommend in how you engage match the MatchCom or your program office. Yeah, fully, fully agree with that. Um, from, from the MatchCom level, uh, different functionals are gonna be, you know, diff varying levels of engagement. Some, some are better than others. And unfortunately, a lot of that's personality based. Um, but even a not super engaged or a you know not super into innovation, et cetera, functional is going to respond to an email from your squadron superintendent or your squadron commander, um, the, that level of, of leadership. So at the bare minimum, if you can't get, get them on board, they're not, you know, respond to your emails, but whatever. As long as you get your squadron leadership on board and potentially your group, um, that will get attention from the MAGCOM, whether they want to or not. And then from a, from a funding perspective, um, to, to kind of more directly address one of the questions in, in the chat as far as, you know, stealing funding or, or, or that sort of thing. It's really not about, you know, in the near term, uh, you know, the, the, the next fiscal year's budget is, is baked in right now, basically. So what we're more talking about when we say we're, we're trying to work down the road is, okay, it's, the, it's that next two, three uh, fiscal years uh, out into the future of, okay, the, there was funding for something and maybe that thing needs to be funded, but maybe it doesn't. And, and we actually experienced that with uh, one of the projects that is, is involved with our SIBRs and it ties back in with a modernization effort for legacy piece of equipment that we basically ultimately came to the conclusion um, talking between ourselves, uh, users in the field and the program office that nope, we don't actually need to spend X amount of money on trying to modernize this 30 year old piece of equipment we can just take a little bit of that money, modernize some of it, take the rest of that money and redirect it towards buying new equipment that in theory could be based off some of the work we're doing with the SIBR. Great, thank you both for your input. Greg, are there any other questions we want to address this time out of chat? Yes, there was, a, there was an earlier one about uh, long-term funding and how do you span that valley of death. So if, if you are, if the game plan is to rob later stage programs in order to pay for the prototype that you're doing, what is the thought process that you go through in order to uh, accomplish that? Or is there a way to program that funding up uh, early on? I think it's really important. Um, I don't know. Is this directed at somebody specifically? No, it wasn't uh, for the panel to answer as we see fit. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So um, that can be really hard. I think it's the, um, in, in my, I wear two hats and in one of my hats, I'm doing the data stuff that we're talking about here. And the other hat, I'm actually working for the space acquisition management director that was just stood up under Spock, one of the field commands under Space Force. And one of the things that we're talking about on a regular basis is that value of death. We're talking specifically about how do we get from an AFWorks, you know, SIBR phase two maybe, or, you know, potentially phase three, into a, a sustainment line um, like 
a success story that we've had with the Unified Data Library because a lot of things get lost, as we know, from that either a phase two or a phase one and, and never actually make it into an operational, uh, what I would call that operational life cycle, right? And that has to do a lot of times with mirroring up the funding um, with, with a long-term requirement. And so to say that we're gonna have a crystal ball and we're gonna know everything an operator needs um, from the time it goes from AppWorks all the way into um, integration into maybe an operation center, et cetera, it's not realistic. What is realistic is doing a better job of marrying up, in my opinion, the front end with the back end. And what I mean by that is a lot of folks in the operational community understand exactly what they need, or they understand it enough to know what the a, a general concept of what they needed to do. Um, and there's funding being planned for that activity um, in the palm, right? Five-year process, yada, yada, right? We've got to the guys that are coming and saying, hey, this is the one thing I need, we've got to marry those units up um, to that sustainment arm in the future. So if, if somebody from that unit, unit X says, I need this thing, who are the sustainment functions of that unit long-term that we can actually create the process and complete the process from the SIBR all the way through another vehicle maybe um, and long-term that actually uh, gets the operational um, unit what they need when they talked about it five years ago and we're planning maybe just a third of the cost of, of what it actually ends up being. I think continually uh, re-engaging the unit that actually needs the thing that, that we're building is really, really important. That's something that we've had to go to each unit and say, hey, look, we can host your data needs. Don't worry about hosting that on that server, or upgrading your servers. We can put it in the cloud. We can expose it. And then we're sharing the cost, but, but the data piece is a, is a little bit unique. Great, thank you, Autumn. Um, so there is a question, how do we see potential duplicate efforts underway? Is there a way to provide input on efforts, uh, sorry, where you have similar issues? Joey, can you speak on that? Yeah, but actually, I was going to pass this off to Greg uh, as oh, he's leading the efforts on how to address this. I mean, there's the digital innovation dashboard. You have the AppWorks portfolio. Uh, Greg, I'm not going to step on your toes. All you, buddy. No worries, Joey. So appreciate that. So the the efforts that are underway uh, are are largely revolving around how do we take things from idea generation through the programmatics of getting it to that point where people can make decisions on it, be able to track and manage and, and do all those other efforts. So we're, AFWorks and AFVentures are engaged in those conversations to help bring that to fruition. But ultimately, uh, the near-term opportunities that are out there is act in the actual platform, uh, uh, API platform, idea scale. There are the ability to link ideas together. So uh, Alexander, I'm, I'm talking to that question that you put out there of when, when you put out your idea in the actual submission place, there is a, an opportunity, you, opportunity for you to link your idea to others. And so you can, you can create this collaborative environment inside the platform as it currently stands. That is a future that we want to take forward, but uh, we encourage everybody to be as engaged as possible and see what other people are doing and what other problems are out there that people are trying to solve so that we, we create as much opportunity for people to work together as possible. Great, thank you, Greg. So as we're coming up at the end of our uh, webinar, are there any last minute comments that any of our panelists would like to uh, speak on? Yeah, hey, this process yeah. of getting companies through the pipeline is not the, it's not super easy yet, right? We've, we've done a good job getting 21 companies, Stratify Awards, there have been quite a few companies that have gotten phase threes. The, the key thing here is that we're building this process and changing the Air Force as we're doing it. We're building the Air mm -hmm. Force with a faster requirements process that can take warfighter needs, the airmen that are at the flight level, that are executing the mission, and bringing those capabilities into our fight. And that's what we need to keep doing and keep pushing on these boundaries. So thank you to all the PPOCs and the government folks that are a part of this change and the companies that are working with us through this. Hey, we're moving as fast as we can. We as a nation to defend 
where we are to defend our freedoms and liberties and to beat China, we have to move faster and integrate technologies. And so thank you for being a part of this. Thank you. Hey, Jody, I'd like to piggyback on that and say, look, it, it's about a network, right? And so we're not going to solve every problem today. Um, but from a space force perspective, like space works just showed up, right? General Crider's big on like pushing that. And, and I'm really big on as we're looking to stand up in an innovation team that does nothing but talk through how we help what I would call that life cycle um, loop completion out of Spock. I need a network, right? Like I can't do it on my own. Uh, there are so many contract uh, contracting agencies, offices out there that are doing amazing stuff. And we just got to spend, uh, in my opinion, we got to spend a little bit of time networking a little bit to make sure that, hey, let's leverage the best out of all these offices. You know, I had a conversation with um, AFRL yesterday. I talked to SMC, Spock now, you know, I had a conversation, uh, another conversation yesterday with uh, the guys out at Maui that are doing a lot of cool innovation stuff. So um, I encourage everybody, not just on this call, but on others to, uh, to network, email me, um, stay in touch, right? Maybe, maybe we have something out of our acquisitions office that we're doing that could help um, move one of these efforts forward. And I think people are the key to this. Thank you. Those are, those are good words of encouragement from both of you. Um, as you see, TPOX are a major or a major aspect of a successful project, um, but you must network and we must work with our ecosystem to uh, create that process and refine it. So, awesome. I think we've highlighted um, how each one of your uh, experiences has elevated your work center, your, pro your problem area. Um, Greg, is there anything else you'd like to um, add before we get off today? Yeah, Vanessa, appreciate that. So uh, a couple of parting shots uh, are one, we, there are a lot of opportunities. So to touch on one of the questions that just were posted, we're going to be highlighting TACFI and STRATFI, which are two ways that TPOX and companies can move forward to bridge the valley of death or to accomplish their, uh, to accomplish goals that may be beyond what the original scope of effort looked like. So please tune in later to those uh, additional sessions uh, they'll, they'll be live streamed as well. Uh, and then the, the final shot is that we, like everybody already mentioned, we really appreciate everybody tuning in and, and working with us so that we can make the force better and we can bring in these companies and these technologies that are vital to us being successful. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to myself. I'll drop my email in the chat and we can get you plugged into to the rest of the ecosystem. So panelists, appreciate your time and your comments, and we will have everybody drop off and head back to the main space. So thank you for your time. Thanks, guys. Thanks for inviting us.